Hello, and welcome to Module 2 of this online workshop on free speech in K-12 schools. The focus of this module, which is the second in the series of five, will address employee or staff speech rights in K-12 schools. I will provide an overview of three key cases that frame the guiding principles for educators, and then we will review two scenarios and see how these principles apply in different situations. The first case relevant to our discussion here is referred to as the Pickering case, which was decided by the Supreme Court in 1968. In this case, there was a high school teacher in Illinois named Marvin Pickering, who was dismissed after writing a letter to a local newspaper, which criticized how his Board of Education and the district superintendent had handled past proposals to renew, to raise new revenue for the schools. The school claimed that this action impeded their ability to function efficiently while being publicly criticized by an employee. The claim that his writing of the letter was protected by his First and Fourteenth Amendment rights was rejected by the Board of Education and he appealed this to the Circuit Court and then to the Supreme Court of Illinois, which both affirmed his dismissal. The Supreme Court of the United States agreed that the teacher's First Amendment right to free speech was violated and reverse the decision of the Illinois Supreme Court. The key factor in this decision is that teachers do not lose their rights as private citizens to comment on items of public concern. In their decision, the justices note that such protections should not be extended in cases where there are false or reckless statements, but there was no indication that the statements in this case were reckless or false, and thus he should have been protected and his speech should not have been punished by the school. The second case is referred to as the Mount Healthy case and involves a social studies teacher, Fred Doyle, who had been teaching in this Mount Healthy district in Ohio for five years, but then was denied tenure and further employment after he had allegedly made an obscene gesture towards students and had spoke out against school district dress codes on a phone call to a local radio station. These reasons were documented in the letter dismissing him. After securing employment at another district, he filed a complaint against his former employer. And what's interesting about this case is it did establish key legal frameworks for personnel action related to First Amendment issues for teachers. So this is now referred to as the Mount Healthy test. And in cases where teachers believe they are fired or experience adverse personnel action as a result of their expression, there are two key factors that must be examined. The first is that the plaintiff must prove that the activity in question was actually protected speech, so falls under the guidelines for um, protected speech for employees, particularly public school teachers. Secondly, the defendant or the school district in these cases must also prove that whatever personnel action happened was not directly related to the speech act or would have happened regardless of if that speech act had happened so that that was not directly related to the teacher's constitutional protected speech. The third and final case relevant here is not one about public school educators but about public employees that can be applied to educators in public schools and thus is worthy of our consideration. In this case, uh, Richard, Richard Ceballos, an employee of the LA District Attorney's Office, found that a sheriff had misrepresented facts in a search warrant affidavit, and Ceballos notified the attorneys prosecuting the case stemming from that arrest, and they all agreed that this affidavit was questionable. However, the DA's office did not dismiss the case. Ceballos then told the defense that he believed the affidavit contained false statements, and the counsel subpoenaed him to testify. So Ceballos, Ceballos alleged that the district attorneys in the office then retaliated against him because he did cooperate with the defense and he argued that this was a speech act protected by the First Amendment. However, um, what was found in this case was that he was um, acting pursuant to his duties and because he was acting as an employee pursuant to his duties, he should have followed the directives of his superior. So in this case, there's a two-pronged test that has emerged that A, is the employee speaking as a private citizen on a matter of public concern? Or B, 
did the government body have adequate reason to take action against the employee? Meaning, does the state have a compelling interest to ensure that the employee um, acts in the best interests of the government agency? So as you can see, this is highly germane to situations that teachers might face in their own schools or other um, employers, employees of um, public school districts. So in summary, these three cases provide some key general principles that can be applied to other related cases about employee speech rights in K-12 schools. We have the Pickering case that established that teachers do have rights as private citizens to comment on matters of public concern. Secondly, we have the Mount Healthy test where the employee has to prove that the speech they engaged in was protected. And then the school district has to prove that the personnel action was unrelated to that protected speech. And third, the Garcetti case, which shows that the government interests to restrict employee speech um, pursuant to their duties must be compelling and clear if they're going to take action um, against an employee for their speech. So let's take these three cases and the principles they've presented us and apply them to two different scenarios. The first scenario involves a ninth grade government class where a teacher stated that the school had declined since the 60s and had complained about trash on school grounds and referred to students making out on the tennis courts. This was in reference to a rumor about two students who's, who had been caught on the tennis courts the day before. And when the parents heard that the teacher had repeated this rumor in his class, they complained to the school. As a result, he was placed on paid administrative leave for four days and a reprimand letter was placed in his file telling him he must refrain from commenting on items that, quote, might negatively reflect on the student body. About eight months later, the teacher filed suit against the district claiming that his speech rights had been violated and chilled by the administration's actions. Now, I would like you to take a moment and reflect on the following questions. Either jot down some notes uh, for yourself or preferably confer with a colleague who's participating in this workshop with you. I want you to think about, do you think this was protected speech? Consider if these comments were made, quote, pursuant to his official duties, unquote, or if he was speaking as a private citizen on a matter of public concern. Do you believe the administration's actions were related to the teacher's speech? Please pause the video and consider your responses to these prompts. Well, this case actually happened in Denver and was decided in 1991. And basically, the court sided with the school and denied Miles' motion, basically saying that the speech he engaged in was not constitutionally protected. It wasn't part of his official duties to spread rumors or talk negatively about students. And therefore, the school was justified in their personnel action because his speech was not constitutionally protected and he was not speaking as a private citizen on a matter of public concern. He was speaking as a teacher commenting on um, the behavior of, of students in his building. Okay, our next scenario is a slightly different one, and this is a case that happened in Florida where there was a state, state statute that requires that the history courses infuse more African and African-American history into the curriculum. A history teacher in that state believed that the local school district was failing to require other history teachers to infuse this content into their curriculum. As a result, this teacher voiced his concerns at various school board meetings. Subsequent to his speeches at the board meetings, this teacher who had been tenured was transferred many times to different schools and was eventually terminated. He argues that this was a result of his critique of the district's implementation of the state statute. Now, I want you to again, pause the video and reflect on the following questions. Do you feel like this is speech that was protected by the First Amendment? Do you feel like the district's actions were defensible based on the principles you've learned so far? Pause and jot down some notes or talk with a partner. So this case was decided in 2007 in Palm Beach County. And in this case, the court ruled that the history teacher, Mr. Sherrod, was speaking as a citizen on a matter of public concern at the board meetings. Because as a teacher, his official job duties did not include curriculum development, 
or ensuring that the district complied with state statutes, he was not speaking pursuant to his official duties. Furthermore, they ruled that his speech outweighed the government's interest in efficiency and that he presented his concerns at a public board meeting and this did not affect the harmony at the schools where he worked. Additionally, he was a parent of two children in the school district and so he was also speaking as a concerned parent and he absolutely had that right. Ironically, the termination proceedings did not actually follow district policy, which required evaluations of teaching to include data from student performance on state tests. So there were other procedural issues with the way they terminated him um, that aren't exactly relevant to our conversation here, but still are interesting to pay attention to. As a result, he did win his case. However, he did not elect to be reinstated because he found another teaching job in a neighboring district. So there's some general principles that as professional educators, I want to highlight for you coming out of this module. First, if your administration has given you clear directives on what to teach or what not to teach, quote unquote, pursuant to your duties in the classroom or your role in the school, Garcetti states you do need to follow these directives. However, teachers do have a right to speak out as private citizens on matters of public concern, particularly if you are a parent in the district or there are other larger implications for decisions being made um, for the community at large. Now, if you are experiencing backlash due to a speech act and you believe it is protected based on what you've learned so far, please contact your union representative to ensure you are well informed and supported and you might also be able to reach out to your local ACLU or other advocacy organization to see if they can provide some additional support if you are experiencing um, negative personnel action or hostile climate at work. Finally, we know that civic engagement projects are meaningful and engaging relevant learning opportunities for students, but you may be subject to greater scrutiny due to the public nature of some of these projects. So if you do choose to engage in something like this, please make sure you have the administrative knowledge and support, preferably in writing, um, before engaging in these campaigns, which might in involve letter writing to public officials, um, engaging in lobby days where students speak out about events or um, ballot initiatives that they think are important to them, or other kinds of student activism that might be happening on your school site. You need to be very um, judicious in the ways in which you do that and make sure that you are not contravening any direct um, advice from your uh, employers. So this has been our second module on teacher and staff expression. The following modules will be focusing on balancing competing rights, specifically those of religion and expression, and then moving on to talking about creationism, intelligent design and evolution, as well as a final bonus session with various scenarios that will pr present uh, additional cases of relevance to our topic here.